Hey everyone, this is Mullen Memory. I'm Alex Mullen, World Memory Champion. And what I wanted to do with this entire video series is walk you through the different images that I used to remember certain things. And then what you'll be doing is using my pre-made images and placing them onto your personal loci. So hopefully that'll make the whole process a little easier, a little quicker for you. You'll be able to use my pre-made images and just put them onto your personal loci and then have strong images to work with uh, for the future. So in this particular video, I'm gonna be talking about opioid analgesics, the general topic being central nervous system pharmacology. So all this information is lifted directly from the review book First Aid, which is a great review book for the step one exam for medical students. Um, so just a quick note, you know, a lot of these images are, you know, they are personal images. So if, you know, one or two of them doesn't really vibe very uh, strongly for you personally, feel free to change it. Feel free to enhance, you know, the images that I talk about for your own personal benefit. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and get started. What you're going to need for this video is 10 loci to work with. So if you don't already have them, you know, just start right now. Choose 10 loci that you're going to use, and then I'll be walking you through each locus and you can place my images onto your loci. So 10 loci to start. So here are, there are nine different drugs that are in this category of opioid analgesics. And so those are uh, these nine shown here, and we're gonna go through them one by one. So we'll start with morphine. So go to your first locus. Now imagine Morpheus from the Matrix. So we've got Morpheus representing morphine interacting somehow with your first locus. Our second drug in opioid analgesics is fentanyl. We're gonna represent fentanyl using the phantom of the opera. So fentanyl, phantom of the opera. So now imagine Morpheus interacting in some way with the phantom of the opera. Maybe they're both holding hands and really passionately belting out this uh, ballad during some sort of um, opera. The next one is codeine. So for codeine, we're gonna imagine a coding spy. So coding spy for codeine. And we're gonna imagine that while Morpheus and the Phantom of the Opera are belting their ballad, this coding spy is stealing all of their personal information. Maybe he's sort of situated to the, just to the side of the locus and he's sort of going on their computers and stealing all of their personal information. The next drug is loperamide. So for loperamide, we're gonna imagine an au pair. So au pair for loperamide. And we're gonna imagine this au pair as an assistant to our coding spy for coding. Now, last in this one locus, we've got methadone. And so we're gonna represent methadone as a Methodist. So that could be a Methodist person that you know, it could be just a general Methodist preacher. And so we're gonna imagine that this Methodist preacher for methadone has been kidnapped by our villains here, the coding spy for codeine, and the au pair loperamide. So that wraps up our first locus. We've got Morpheus from Morphine singing with the Phantom of the Opera while the coding spy and his assistant, the au pair, um, steal their information and take a Methodist hostage. Now move on to your second locus. We've got four more drugs here in this category of opioid analgesics. The first of those is meperidine. So meperidine, I'm gonna think of my peri. And so my peri dining. So I'm gonna imagine maybe Matthew Perry from the Friend Show, you know, sitting on this second locus. Maybe he's watching the sort of drama in the first locus and he's just enjoying a nice dinner there watching that dinner theater. So you can use any, you know, like I said, feel free to use your own. If you know a personal, per you know, a person uh, that you know personally who is named Perry, um, that, that works great. So we've got meperidine, peridine. So our next one is dextromethorphan. And I'm gonna imagine a meth orphan. So an orphan who's maybe hopped up on some meth. And uh, we're gonna imagine that he's right next to peridining. And maybe peri is kind of handing him some of his food. Um, and this orphan is hopped up on meth and really, really enjoying the food that's coming to him from meperidine, peridine. Third one is diphenoxylate. So diphenoxylate kind of sounds a little bit like Fort Knox. So Fort Knox for diphenoxylate, and then for Fort Knox, we can imagine maybe a gold bar. Gold bar, think of Fort Knox diphenoxylate. 
So maybe we'll imagine that Meperidine, the Perry guy, is there and he's eating a gold bar. He's actually got his fork and knife and he's digging into this gold bar uh, for dinner here. The last one is Pentazosin. So Pentazosin kind of sounds like penthouse. So penthouse makes me think of, for instance, Hugh Hefner uh, from Playboy or something like that. So what I'm going to imagine is, you know, we've got this, this scene here with Perry and the meth orphan and he's eating a gold bar and maybe Hugh Hefner is coming up and as his assistant he's helping feed him and uh, wait on him as he's eating. So there you have it, we've got nine different drugs um, in our first two loci. Move to your, to your third locus and we will discuss the mechanism of all of these different opioid analgesics. So what they do is they act on, they act as agonists on opioid receptors obviously. So for a receptor, what I like to usually do is imagine a satellite dish. So, you know, one of those um, dishes you use to receive satellite TV. So on your third locus, imagine a giant satellite disc sitting on top of it. Now we need, to, we, know the, we need to know the different types of those opioid receptors. So those are morphine, encephalin, and dynorphin. Okay, so we're going to start with dynorphin. Dynorphin sounds like dynamite fan. So we're gonna imagine maybe directly above this giant satellite dish, we've got a fan that's made out of dynamite, a dynamite fan, dynorphin, that's spinning around really quickly, maybe kind of you can imagine blowing air down into this satellite dish. Now we'll move on to morphine. So morphine we already had an image for, it was Morpheus, right? So imagine Morpheus uh, sitting inside this dish and maybe reaching up with his hands and trying to touch the spinning fan. And we'll imagine that he touches it and then his fan get, is, sorry, his hand gets cut as he's sticking his hand up into that dynamite fan dynorphin. So now maybe you'd imagine that he needs to do something about his bleeding hand. And so now is when he whips out his handy dandy Kaplan medical textbook. So you'll notice that Kaplan maybe sounds a little bit like encephalin or encephalin for Kaplan textbook. So he's just cut his hand by touching the dynorphin and now he's using his Kaplan medical textbook to figure out what to do. So what the way these work, right, is they'll bind to the opioid receptors and then they block or they, they decrease synaptic transmission by opening calcium, sorry, by opening potassium channels and closing calcium channels. So what those things do is they hyperpolarize the cell, make it harder for the neuron to send a signal um, along the nerve. So now we can imagine perhaps that he's instead of, you know, he's kind of just given given up on the Kaplan textbook and he just grabs a big jug of milk, so milk to represent calcium there, and he pours it all over and closes up that wound. So that'll represent the closing of the calcium channels. And now he'll open up that wound back up and sort of imagine him opening it back up as if it were a banana peel. So he's pulling away the sides and that's opening up those potassium channels there. Okay, now so they operate sort of in two different ways. We had those, um, the top thing, where uh, they're modulating synaptic transmission and they also directly inhibit the release of all these different neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. So we'll move on now to a new locus to discuss that second, um, that second piece of this mechanism. So we've got these five different neurotransmitters here. Acetylcholine is the first one. So how are we gonna represent that? We'll start with an ax. So an ax kind of just looks like that little ACH there. So we're on our new locus and we're just imagining that there's an ax kind of, you know, whacked into the locus. For norepinephrine, norepinephrine sounds kind of like Norse to me. So I always thought of Norse and thought of um, the Norse god Thor. So, you know, you might've seen the recent movies Thor with uh, Chris Hemsworth. And so I imagine him with that giant hammer. Uh, in this case, maybe he's trying to grab that ax which is stuck into our locus and he can't really get it out. The next one is 5-HT or serotonin um, as it's more often called. And so for serotonin, I like to imagine a serrated knife. So serotonin kind of sounds like serrated knife. So maybe we imagine that as Thor is trying to pull this ax out of our locus, He's just impaled with this giant serrated knife, serrated knife for serotonin. And so now um, for glutamate, glutamate kind of sounds like glue eight. So maybe it's glue that dries in eight seconds. So that could be super glue. So maybe we imagine that there's a bunch of super glue 
attached to our serrated knife, anchoring it to our locus. The next one is substance P. And for substance P, I just think of pliers because of P for pliers. So now we imagine that, you know, maybe Thor has got this giant serrated knife impaling him and there's glue attaching the knife. And now he takes pliers and starts to tr try to pick at that glue and remove it so he can get that serrated knife out of his chest. So that covers all of our images that we need to understand the mechanism of our opioid analgesics. Move on to your next locus. So now we're going to be start to, to cover the clinical uses of opioid analgesics, and we're going to do this over a couple of different loci. We're not going to just do them all in one locus because there's just a few too many. So we'll start with pain. So pain, I like to think of Voldemort from Harry Potter just because he's a very evil character. Uh, he causes a lot of pain. So we'll use Voldemort to represent pain. So imagine Voldemort near your new locus. Now for cough suppression, I like to imagine a coffin for cough. So imagine, you know, Voldemort maybe is part of this sort of evil gang along with the au pair and along with the coding spy, and he's tired of waiting for them uh, to come, so he decides to get and wait in his coffin. And now what happens is we have our meth orphan from our original uh, couple of loci nailing in that coffin shut to uh, suppress the coffin. So that's how we'll remember that dextromethorphan is the particular opioid analgesic that suppresses cough. Move on to a new locus now. So now one of the key clinical uses for all of these is diarrhea. So on your new locus, imagine a giant stool balancing on that locus. So I like to use a stool, like a physical stool, to represent stool as in um, feces, right? So for diarrhea. So um, loperamide and diphenoxylate are the ones that treat diarrhea specifically. So imagine our au pair really just barely balancing atop that stool that's balanced on your locus. Okay, and then for diphenoxylate, recall that was our Fortnox gold bar. So imagine that she's, you know, got hold of this gold bar. She really wants to keep it, but she's unfortunately kind of struggling to balance on this stool here. And now for acute pulmonary edema, acute pulmonary edema sort of sounds like aquarium for the acute part, and then the, the water in the aquarium or the fish tank uh, sort of represents the edema that's going on. So what we'll imagine in this same locus is that, you know, despite the au pair's best effort, she falls off the stool into this giant fish tank. So for our next locus, so we'll be moving on to a new locus now, we're going to talk about the fact that these drugs are used to, uh, as ma you know, for maintenance programs for heroin addicts. So for heroin addicts, I'm going to imagine Paris Hilton. I, I don't know what it was, um, just something to do with the drugs, but I thought of Paris Hilton when I saw para, heroin addicts. Uh, and the way, you know, the drugs that are used for this are methadone and then also buprenorphin and naloxone together. So the way we'll represent this is at our new locus, we'll have Paris Hilton standing there, maybe looking up at the locus, and maybe on top of the locus, we'll have our, uh, our Methodist, our preacher or your friend uh, Methodist, whatever it is, um, and, the, and the Methodist is kind of talking down and counseling Paris Hilton on how to get over her hair addiction. So now what we'll imagine is that this Methodist has an assistant that's helping him or her do this because obviously it's very hard to uh, fix Paris Hilton's heroin addiction. So for buprenorphine, we're going to need a new image and we'll imagine a blueprint. So buprenorphine kind of sounds like blueprint there. And naloxone, nalox makes me think of the Loch Ness Monster. So the assistant to our Methodist will be the Loch Ness Monster holding a blueprint and sort of, you know, helping out our Methodist to wean Paris Hilton off of heroin. So that co covers all of our different clinical uses for the opioid analgesics. Now finally, we'll talk about toxicity. So again, we're going to spread our information about toxicity over a few different loci. So first, let's tackle addiction. So addiction, I like to think of a D.A.R.E. officer. So maybe you know you remember back when you were in elementary school, a D.A.R.E. officer came and talked about drugs and drug use and, and addiction. So I see addiction and I think of a D.A.R.E. officer. So imagine the D.A.R.E. officer at your new locus. Next is respiratory depression. Respiratory depression, often for respiratory, I think of SpongeBob because the sponginess of him sort of reminds me of the sponginess of the lungs. So maybe we'll imagine our D.A.R.E. officer 
right on top of a fallen down SpongeBob, sort of depressing him down. So that's respiratory depression, and then the dear officer is addiction. That's all we're gonna have in that locus. So we'll move now to a new locus. And that new locus will have, we have constipation. And for constipation, I'll represent that as a little goat. And I like to do that just because uh, goats are often known for their very tiny um, feces. So I just think of constipation um, as relating to that. So we'll have a, new, um, a tiny goat in our new locus. And meiosis will represent with uh, little pins that are maybe coming out of a push, push pin, uh, of one of those little uh, pin cushions, sorry. So we'll imagine our little goat running down or running on our new locus, and maybe as he's doing that, he accidentally sticks his hoof into one of these pins that's coming out of our pin cushion. So that's gotta hurt, right? Uh, and so for this next little line here, tolerance does not develop to meiosis and constipation, uh, I'm just going to imagine slipping a wedding ring onto the little spot where the pin stuck into our goat's hoof. And so that'll help us remember that, so the wedding ring represents forever, for instance. So, you know, forever, every time you're going to be getting meiosis, pinpoint pupils, and constipation. That's our goat. Now we have additive CNS depression with other drugs. And so for that, what we can do is, you know, imagining this whole scene with the goat falling down, hitting the pin. We'll just imagine that all that disruption bothered this, this computer, this old sort of, you know, maybe Windows 98 computer just next door. And maybe the, the, fall, court, uh, the fall made it flicker on and then sort of feebly flicker off. So that's our CNS depression. And then finally, you know, how are we going to treat all these different toxicities? We've got addiction, respiratory depression, constipation, meiosis, CNS depression. We use naloxone or naltrexone. Those are both opioid receptor antagonists, so they'll just directly block that opioid receptor. Remember, there were three of them. So um, for that, we're gonna do a new locus again, and we'll represent naloxone as we did before with the Loch Ness Monster. And then maybe for naltrexone, that kind of sounds like T-Rex. You can see the T-Rex in there. So we'll imagine a Loch Ness Monster and a T-Rex fighting on top of that last and tenth location. So that covers all of the images we, we um, want to know for toxicity of the opioid analgesics. So now take a second and review. Go through each of these questions here, review it in your memory palace, really try to see those images and recall the information. Now what I would encourage you to do is at each locus, really try to ask yourself two questions. First of all, what's going on in reality? And second of all, why is it that way? So really try to justify to yourself what's going on. Try to understand, don't just get too bogged down in the memorization process. But what I think this will do is really give you a concrete set of memories to have and look at. Uh, and that should help your overall, overall understanding of opioid analgesics a lot. Um, I hope this was helpful, uh, you know, giving you a quick way to use my images on your personal loci uh, and really have strong memories for the future. So what I really would encourage you to do as well is review often. Um, you know, review is something that I'm doing all the time and I think it's really an essential part of this whole process. You can't just put the images and neglect it and expect it to remember it. Expect to remember it in two months. That's just not how human memory works. You're gonna need to review it. But what this will do, I think, is really give you um, a strong base, a concrete set of memories that you can always be looking back on uh, to really strengthen your overall understanding. Um, and so I hope that was helpful.